and also international criminal invisible objectified and forgotten. That's me saying very promising, that's it. Um, so in this talk, I will try to explain the extent to which animals are present and absent from international criminal law. And two clear trends should transpire from the analysis. On the one hand, when we look at the current list of crimes, of international crimes, um, uh, we will see that animals are largely invisible. Um, and when they sometimes are covered by the crimes um, of the International Criminal Court, for example, in a very indirect manner, we will see that animals end up being objectified. The second trend is that when we look at the new initiative to introduce the crime of ecocide in the list of international crimes, we will see that animals have been largely forgotten. So as a preliminary matter, let me um, explain for those who don't know what is international criminal law. International criminal law is a branch of public international law that is concerned with investigating, prosecuting and punishing individuals as opposed to states or organizations. There is not a uniform and definitive list of international crimes, but typically we will be referring to crimes that are of such heinous nature that deserve um, international um, uh, investigation and punishment, such as war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, and the crime of aggression. These are referred to as the core crimes. But the concept of international crimes might include also other forms such as the crime of piracy or terrorism. International criminal laws practice in international or high tribunals, and the International Criminal Court or ICC, based in The Hague in the Netherlands, is the most prominent example of such a tribunal because it has a permanent uh, basis, it has a permanent aspiration, and because it has been um, accepted by 123 states. That is to say that 123 states have ratified the Rome Statute, also known as the ICC Statute. The Statute of the International Criminal Court gives the court material jurisdiction over the four court crimes. That is four crimes, crimes humanity, genocide, and the crime of aggression. A deeper look into this list of crimes under the remit of the ICC, which is exemplary of international crimes in general, shows that animals are invisible. That is, to this day, there is no international crime focused on animals as such. This in contrast with the extent and degree of harm that we know is typically inflicted upon animals in humanitarian crises like armed conflicts and other crisis scenarios leading to mass atrocities. That animals play a role in war and that they are harmed by war and humanitarian disasters is a historical fact. Think, for example, of the Deakin Medal, uh, the highest award that an animal can receive while serving in military conflicts and is awarded um, in the UK every year since, 19, since 1943. And it's given to animals, to one animal a year, to acknowledge their outstanding acts of bravery, devotion, or duty displayed serving with the armed forces or civil defense units in any theater of war in the world, um, in the world at all. The award is a bronze medal bearing description for gallantry, and we also saw. Here we have the picture of Luca, which is was a retired U.S. Marine Corp dog, which was awarded the um, Deakin Medal, I believe, in 2012. Because during her six years of service, she successfully completed 400 separate missions, and her skills as search and rescue dog ensured that no human casualties ever happened under her watch. On her final note, patrol in 2012 in Afghanistan, an explosive detonated under her, uh, which made her lose one of her, one of her legs. And as a result, Luca was not only awarded the Deakin Medal, but also an official, an official Purple Hearts uh, Medal, which is a US military condecoration awarded in the name of the president to those killed or wounded during service. Other reminders that um, animals suffer and are used to war come from memorials such as the one that exists, uh, the Animal War Memorial that exists in London, which pays tribute 
to all animals that served, suffered, and died alongside the British Commonwealth and Allied forces in the wars and conflicts of the 20th century. We can also find examples of the animal involvement, uh, active or passive involvement in war um, in, in, in our masterpieces like Picasso's Guernica, where you can see at the forefront there is a horse in agony, a cow, and in the, back, in the background there is a dove. More recent and documented examples of animal suffering in connection to war takes us to Yemen, where in 2016, 265 animals were left to die out of starvation and disease in the Thais Sioux. In some, alongside humans, animals are conscripted and victimized during war and other so called humanitarian crises. In the ICC statute, which is a prime example of the practice of international criminal law, there is no crime against animals as such. In fact, the word animal is not used at all in the ICC statute or in any other related instrument connected to the International Criminal Court. There are, however, a number of crimes that could indirectly capture misbehavior against animals but none of them is actually focused or concerned with animals, be it their welfare or their individual well-being. And here are three main examples of those crimes that could indirectly capture some behavior, misbehavior against animals. First, we have the crime of starvation as a war crime, um, which is defined as intentionally using starvation of civilians as a method of war for, by, by depriving them of objects indispensable to their survival. Even though um, it is not explained in the statute, it is understood that those objects that are indispensable for the survival of human beings include things such as water, crops, and livestock. But um, this crime is entirely anthropocentric because killing livestock as such is not a crime. It is only a crime in as much as they have a human function and in as much as they are necessary for the survival of the human population. This is to say that killing one cow out of uh, a herd of 20 cows would hardly meet the requirement and the threshold of this crime. And killing animals in the wild will be entirely outside the scope of this crime. A second crime that sometimes is mentioned as being potentially relevant to animals is the crime of pillage. In fact, one of the persons that has been convicted by the International Criminal Court, Roman Katanga, was in part convicted for the crime of pillage, which involved the pillaging of cows and, and cattle in general. However, the crime of pillage does not intend to protect the object, the object is stolen, but the private property of the human owner that sees his possessions taken away. The crime of pillage, furthermore, has a number of specific conditions that need to be met for it to exist. And these very specific conditions are an issue for the widespread practice of poaching in um, world context. As Josh Milburn and Sarah Van Wilson report in their latest paper, Counting animals in war, first steps towards an in classic just war theory. Conflict zones frequently coincide with so called biodiversity hotspots. Some 80% of major conflicts in the second half of the last century took place in biodiversity hotspots, even though these only make up to 2% um, of the Earth land surface. As a result, their study recounts that the course of armed conflict is the strongest predictor of a drop in large mammal population um, in the second half of the last century. Moreover, the Security Council issued several resolutions in 2014 um, targeting uh, poaching activities or targeting rebel groups operating in the Democratic Republic of Congo and the Central African Republic on account of their poaching activities and the suspected illicit trafficking that they were committing in ivory trade as a source of generating funding for the rebel groups and the rebel cause. At least one of those alleged leaders um, of such rebel group, of one of those rebel groups, Joseph Coney, has been indicted by the International Criminal Court, although he remains at large. However, the crime of pillage is not easily captured 
uh, sorry, the crime of the poaching is not easily captured by the crime of pillage because the crime of pillage has the following elements. First of all, the perpetrator must have appropriated certain property. And here comes the first complication. That is that we must label wild animals or animals in the wild as property for them to qualify as objects of pillage. This might be at odds with the domestic legislation of the country where the um, conduct took place. And it's definitely at odds with the domestic legislation of many states party to their own statute that have started to enact legislation in their own civil codes, elevating the status of animals to something more than property. The second complication is that not only animals need to be property for them to be pillaged, they need to be owned by someone because the perpetrator needs to have intended to deprive the owner of the property. And which is a kind of self-defeating to the concept of animal in the wild that by definition is not owned by anyone in particular. And the third complication is that um, for appropriation to qualify as pillage, it needs to be done for private or personal use. And when we're talking about funding rebel groups, it is not a straightforward match to say that um, poaching is done for private or personal use as opposed to organizational use. It is not impossible to argue that it could qualify, but as I said, it's not a straightforward literal match with the reality of poaching on the ground. On a positive um, on a positive note, please be aware that there is an ongoing initiative in the field of transnational criminal law to adopt a new protocol to cover the illicit trafficking of wildlife under the ANTOC Convention, that is the United Nations Convention Against Transnational Crime, um, which is the main international instrument in the fight against transnational crime. And this potential optional protocol is currently being discussed and is gaining a lot of traction um, among states. A third example of a crime that could indirectly cover animals is the war crime against the environment. And you see the definition of the word crime there. And the first issue, which is not uh, evident from the uh, definition, um, with the crime against the environment is one of scope. The war crime against the environment under the ICC statute only applies in international armed conflicts as opposed to civil wars or non-international conflicts. And as a result, it does not speak to a great proportion of the current warfare reality, because since World War II, most armed conflicts in the world are civil, that is non-international in nature. But even forgetting that, um, that factor, the concept of environment is not defined in the ICC statute, and whether it includes animals is open to question. For example, the International Law Commission is currently in the process of adopting the draft principles for the protection of the environment in relation to armed conflicts, the so-called PEDAC principles. However, these proposed draft principles do not define the concept of environment, and they do not mention the word animal or fauna for that matter. Once again, animals become invisible when they should be visible, such as in the environment. Now, coming back to the work from against the environment, even if we could reasonably understand that animals are included in the concept of environment, the threshold that needs to be met for this crime to occur, widespread, long-term, and severe damage to the natural environment is so high that the harm that must be caused to animals for them to become visible under this norm would have to be absolutely dramatic. Some sort of attack falling short of causing the extinction of the species. No, I list that. In short, when uh, we look at the current list of crimes of international crimes as exemplified in the ICC statute, animals are invisible. And when they are indirectly captured by some uh, crimes, they are definitely objectified. I said in introduction also that animals are forgotten. And I contend that they are forgotten in the new proposed crime of ecocide, at least in the definition that we're working with now. 
for the past years, the idea that ECA signed to be an international crime on its side and has gained momentum alongside the increased globalization of the effects of climate change and the interdependence that exists between humans and nature. In June 2021, a group of uh, experts composed of 12 international lawyers proposed a definition of the crime of ecocide, which would add a fifth core crime to the four existing ones. One would expect that this agreement of international criminal law would reserve a prominent place for at least animals in the wild because they are part of the environment. Yet, in the definition of the concept of the environment that these proposals proposes, animals have been forgotten. You see that the, um, the crime requires for ecocide to happen an unlawful or wanton act committed with knowledge that there is a substantial likelihood of severe and either widespread or long-term damage to the environment being caused by those acts. And then this proposed definition goes on to define what they mean by environment. Environment means apparently the earth, its biosphere, cryosphere, lithosphere, hydrosphere, and atmosphere, as well as outer space. Probably they mean this definition to include water, rivers, and oceans, since these are components or part of the earth. But no such extension is easily drawn to animals. In other words, this definition of environment is very static or stationary, um, because it doesn't really um, account for what the environment is really composed of. Animals only make an appearance in the definition of the concept of widespread, which is only one possible way of committing ecocide. For ecocide to exist, the um, uh, act needs to cause substantial likelihood of severe and either widespread or long-term damage. So widespread and long-term are the standard. Um, widespread, according to this proposed definition, means damage which extends beyond a limited geographical area, and crosses state boundaries, or in the alternative, is suffered by an entire ecosystem or species or a large number of human beings. And after having analyzed this article, I think I've come to the conclusion that the inclusion of suffering by an entire species might become very superfluous and irrelevant in many instances. And this is because a lot of species exist in a transboundary map that is crossing the state boundaries. See, for example, the, um, the case of giraffe uh, in Africa. So according to the Giraffe Conservation Foundation and partners, and there are four distinct species of giraffe in Africa, the Maasai, the Southern, the Northern, and the Reticulated Giraffe. All of these giraffe species cross boundaries. So I have identified them here in the circles, and all of them um, cross at least one border. Some of them cross many borders. And so if all the members of one such a species of giraffe would need to suffer harm, the damage would necessarily need to be transboundary, will necessarily need to cross boundaries, and many state boundaries in some cases. So when it comes to animals, the proposed crime of ecocide might actually be or might actually be only concerned with species that are already on the brink of extinction, that is, are very limited in number and in geographical spread. Because other than those cases, animals are forgotten in the proposed crime of ecocide. To conclude, this all goes to show that animals have not been subject of concern in respectively the current structure of international criminal law or in its incoming new developments, some of which one would expect like the crime of ecocide to reserve a more protagonist um, place for animals. This probably stems from a deeply entrenched conceptual divide between humans and animals, humans and the environment, and at times also between environment and animals. This very hot very dry and active in wildfires summer in the northern hemisphere reminds us that the um, we are living in the Anthropocene and that this divide no longer holds tenable. 
This artificial division is due to a number of injustices against nature, against animals, but also against humans. Wars and disasters not only victimize humans, humans they victimize, victimize everything around them, things that they also care for, as we've seen in the pictures um, of Minos. In my view, humanitarian crises are not only humanitarian, and by the same token, environmental crises are not only environmental. And we should start caring for victims and the real harm caused by wars and disasters, regardless of the species ascription, and stop invisibilizing the actual extent of the deaths of disasters. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much.